Hello, my name is Samantha Montalegre and welcome to The Maternity Mentor. Today's topic is how to interview an obstetrician or OBGYN. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be discussing how to interview an obstetrician or OBGYN in eight easy categories. I have been a registered nurse for 11 years. I've spent my entire career working in the maternal newborn nursing area, including mother baby postpartum, NICU, antepartum, and labor and delivery. I have practiced as an IBCLC for eight years and have been maternal newborn nursing certified for seven years. I have also received specialized training in perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, as well as perinatal bereavement. Why should you interview? Well, this obstetrician is gonna guide your care for the next nine months. They will be entrusted to follow your birth plan and they will decide when medical interventions are needed. Please remember that many of these questions apply to both a certified nurse midwife as well as an OBGYN. However, there are differences. We will be uploading a separate video on how to interview a certified nurse midwife. Let's start with the office. It's important to understand the operation and policies of the office as you will interact with them a lot. For example, do they take your health insurance? What are the terms for fees not covered by your insurance? What are the office hours? And they, do they have convenient evening and Saturday hours that meet your schedule? Next, it's important to understand your provider's education and training by asking such questions as, when and where do they receive their training? Are they board certified? Do they have professional or patient references that you can receive? How long have they been in practice? And how many babies have they delivered? A provider's personal practice or philosophy can highly influence their decision making. Make inquiries such as, why did they become involved in obstetrics to begin with? And what is their basic philosophy of birth? You want to ask them what informed consent means to them. Informed consent is permission given by a patient to a doctor for treatment with full knowledge of the possible risks and benefits. This often arises in emergencies, so it's important to make sure you and your OBGYN are on the same page. Continuing with practice questions, be sure to ask how they feel about pain management. Some physicians like all of their patients to receive an epidural while others focus on natural pain relief. You may want a natural birth with no anesthesia or you may want an epidural when you walk through the door. Having this conversation about pain management beliefs up front can keep both of you on the same page. It's important to understand the logistics of your birth and what your provider likes to do. You should ask very detailed, comprehensive questions to make sure you understand how things will work and the flow of care you will receive. These questions can include, at which hospitals or birth centers do they have privileges? Do they attend or offer home births? When do they like their patients to come into the hospital when they are in labor? Some doctors prefer you to come in very early when you're having contractions very far apart. Others like you to come in when contractions are closer together and you're further along. How many babies does your provider deliver per week? Do they ever have to reroute patients to another practice or hospital when they are overcrowded or overbooked? You also want to include some questions about communication with your provider. If you have a question, who do you call? Who responds to the call? Do they accept questions via email? Will they discuss health problems or test results over the phone? If they do discuss those results with you, is there a charge for that telephone time? What if you have an emergency after 
office hours, who do you contact, how much time is allowed for a routine visit. You also want to make sure you include some questions about your birth preferences. Are they supportive of you writing a personal birth plan? A birth plan is a written agreement between you and your provider as to how your baby will be delivered. It gives the parents more of a role in the decision-making process. However, the plan is no guarantee that your birthing process will go as you laid it out because complications can arise. If there are problems, your doctor will make decisions based on what is safest for you and your baby. Another question is, can you take photos or video during your delivery? Many providers will allow you to take still photos during labor and delivery, however you do need their consent. Additionally, the birth location may have their own policies on this practice, so inquiring up front is important. Many providers and birth locations will not permit video. Additionally, you want to ask whether you're able to have a professional photographer in the room. Some places allow professional photographers in the room, while others have a limit on the number of people in the delivery room. Can you have a planned cesarean section? Some mothers have very personal reasons for desiring a primary cesarean section, including a history of sexual abuse. It's important to understand whether your provider is willing to provide a primary C-section if it is not medically indicated. Most women will have a repeat cesarean section once they have had one cesarean section. Birth control options post-delivery are very important to many women. Make sure you ask if you can receive a tubal ligation during your cesarean section. Can you receive a tubal ligation after a vaginal delivery before leaving the hospital? A tubal ligation is a surgical procedure to prevent pregnancy permanently. Many women desire permanent birth control after delivering their desired number of children. Many providers will offer a variety of birth control options, including birth control pills, IUDs, and tubal ligation. However, some providers will not offer these due to religious reasons. So if this is something you desire, be sure to ask ahead of time. Inquiring about your provider's collaboration allows you to learn who else may be involved in your care and delivery. Your primary care provider may not be available for every visit or your delivery. It's important to understand who may you may receive care from and whether that is acceptable to you. Key questions include, are they in a group practice? How many providers are in that practice? How many delivers, deliveries does the practice handle per month? Do you have a choice about who you see and who delivers your baby? Some women prefer female providers for a variety of reasons, including comfort or religious requirements. It is essential that you understand who you may see and if you are comfortable receiving care from all possible providers. Additionally, ask whether you will see the same caregivers at each appointment or will you see others in the practice. Group practices often rotate providers so patients see everyone's face and have the chance to interact with these different providers. Make sure you understand if this requirement is of the practice so you can be prepared to see new people each visit. Additional practice questions can include, what is the practice's philosophy or mission statement regarding birth? Do they recommend any birth classes? How do they feel about a doula? How do they feel about you obtaining a second opinion? Ask the provider what is the likelihood they will be on call for your birth. Will they be in town around your due date? There are no guarantees that a specific health care provider will deliver your baby since no care provider works 24 hours a day. Make sure you know the other providers in the practice or the providers with whom the doctor shares delivery responsibility. Make sure you ask your provider about birth interventions and possible complications. 
These unexpected situations can be very stressful for parents, and knowing how your provider will handle these should they arise can relieve some of that stress and anxiety. Questions should include, do they handle high-risk pregnancies? What is their policy regarding induction as a practice? How often do they induce labor? Why do they induce labor? And what methods do they use? How do they assist with second stage pushing management? How do they handle labor problems or complications? What do they consider a birth emergency? What is their C-section rate? And what is their primary C-section rate? You also want to ask what is their episiotomy rate? An episiotomy is a surgical incision of the perineum during the second stage, the pushing stage of labor, to quickly enlarge the opening for the baby to pass through. Some providers perform episiotomies as a rule, whereas others choose to allow for natural tearing to occur. Additionally ask, do they use traditional medicine to induce labor and what do they use? Do they require an IV or other medication during labor? What natural methods do they use to alleviate pain during labor? Will you be allowed to move freely and try different positions during your labor? Do they require continuous electronic fetal monitoring during labor? Electronic fetal monitoring is a machine applied to the belly using straps that allows the providers to monitor the baby's heart rate during labor as well as the strength and pattern of your contractions. Electronic fetal monitoring can limit the ability to utilize natural labor positions and many do not allow for ambulation or water immersion such as a tub or shower. Some important questions related to the care of your baby include are they certified in neonatal resuscitation and do they have the equipment necessary to stabilize an infant in an emergency. Make sure you ask and understand what standard testing your provider will expect. Testing can include blood tests, ultrasounds, consults with other providers like a perinatologist, and invasive testing like amniocentesis. Many tests come with additional costs, so you want to be clear what testing will be required as part of your plan of care. For example, what are their thoughts on first trimester invasive genetic testing? What prenatal tests do they require and why? What prenatal tests do they recommend and why? How many ultrasounds do they order and when do they order them? Do they routinely test at the end of pregnancy for preeclampsia and or tests of fetal well-being? What are their thoughts on cervical exams during pregnancy? Cervical exams involve the practitioner inserting their hand in the vagina to check how dilated the cervix is. These exams can be uncomfortable and while performed using sterile gloves can increase the risk of infection. Most providers need and want to perform regular cervical exams starting at 38 to 39 weeks as well as during labor. Care doesn't end in the delivery room. It's important to know how your provider will support you during the postpartum period. Postpartum care starts at one minute of life for your baby. Make sure to ask your provider the following questions. Do they support and assist with cord blood and tissue banking? Cord blood and tissue banking is storing some umbilical cord blood and tissue for future use. Do they routinely protect the golden hour after birth? This is the first hour after birth where the newborn transitions from uterine life to life in the outside world. Do they allow for the breast crawl prior to infant measurements? The breast crawl is an instinct in undisturbed newborns to move towards the nipple and attach themselves to the breasts by themselves through a series of predetermined steps. Allowing a newborn to perform the breast crawl increases breastfeeding success. Does your provider perform circumcisions? How do they support breastfeeding goals? Do they offer breastfeeding classes or a support group? What can you expect from visits with them postpartum? How many visits will you have and how close after delivery? 
What are their thoughts on placenta pills? Placental encapsulation is a practice of ingesting the placenta after it has been steamed, dehydrated, ground, and placed into pills. There have been reports of infections in both mothers and babies after utilizing this practice, and the process of placental encapsulation is not regulated. Therefore, your provider may not support this practice. On the flip side, your provider may suggest this practice to you. If you plan to use placenta pills, ask your OBGYN what their thoughts are and if they will support this practice. We hope that you find this information will help you in your journey to find the right provider for you and your family. Please feel free to share your comments below and let us know what other topics you'd like to hear about. If you like this content, remember to hit that like button and subscribe so you can be the first to receive this information. Please share this channel with your friends and family and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for additional information. We'll link those down below. Thank you so much for joining us at the Maternity Mentor.